morning, everyone, and happy Friday. I'm Jessica Lovell in for our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Steve Stites, today. He'll be back on Monday. So glad you're with us today. We are live inside the Dulce Simons Jr. Family Studio here at the Health System. And to my left is Dr. David Wild. He is the VP of Performance Enhancement here at the Health System. How are you? Very well. How are glad, you? Glad to see you bright and early. Thank and of you. course, Dr. Dana Hawkinson, of course. How are you today? I'm good. Good. It's Friday. It is Friday. <laughs> good to be Friday. Okay, so uh, let's just jump in and talk about overnight numbers. Did they creep up a little bit? Just just a touch. Um, 27 in the hospital. So we've had 25, 26 the last couple days. Um, eight in the ICU and five of those on the ventilator. So we still have, I think, 21, 22 in the hospital that have um, met the criteria uh, for discontinuation of COVID isolation, meaning they've been 10 days out from their diagnosis. Um, we don't count those acutely, but those are patients who have had the disease who are still in for one reason or another. All right, so it's Questions Friday. A lot of you out there who watch every day send in questions. We can't get to them during the week. So we use Friday to answer your questions, and we'll be taking questions from our audience uh, today, too. So send those in. But let's just jump in and get started today. Um, so our first question is, do people who have tested positive for COVID-19 need to isolate from one another? Is there any risk we might make each other sicker? Mm -hmm. Dr. Wild, you want to jump in first with us? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, in general, it's always a good idea um, to practice strict isolation yeah. um, uh, when you are um, or have been told that you've tested positive. So uh, I realize that in certain circumstances, several people in the same household, if you and a child have tested positive, sometimes it's impossible to truly isolate from each other. Instead, you have to sort of isolate from those um, outside the, the household. And that's... I think very reasonable. I know, Dana, yeah. you may feel differently, but um, there's been some question about time of exposure and does yeah. that add to the intensity of the disease? Um, but I don't think that there's a very real risk of a significant difference in, yeah. in your outcome if uh, you are around other people who are positive in your home. Um, yeah, I, I would agree with that. Um, you know, we know that once you do get the infection, you start to have viral replication in your body. You start to have the immune system that kicks in. You start to create antibodies and get the other responses of the immune system. So your body is actually working at that point. If one or two days later your household members get ill, um, they could certainly be um, expressing virus into the environment, but it's probably not going to be at the levels that you, uh, your, your own body has making, been making as your immune system kicks in and start to recover from the disease. So we do know, too, that some of our um, fellow hospitals, academic medical centers that we've been in contact with, some of them will cohort positive patients together. Um, you know, again, still taking as much precaution as possible, distancing, um, having other barriers or curtains in those rooms. So if you can, as Dr. Wild said, it's always a good idea, but we understand that in the household it may be a little bit difficult Yeah, to do just that. trying to use best yeah. practices. Okay, so next question today, why is COVID-19 percent positivity mm. calculated mm. using the number of people tested rather than the general population? Dr. Wild? Yeah, mm. so that's a great question. Mm. I think you see every day we talk about the percent positive. Um, and when uh, we're talking about positivity for those tested, um, we're, we're looking at the disease uh, transmission, how disease is transmitted in the population or in our community, and not necessarily trying to get an overall uh, incidence. Mm -hmm. So the denominator, the question here, why is the denominator only those that have been tested? Um, it's because that helps us understand if we are testing enough right now. Yeah to understand the full picture of spread of disease in the community. So it is very true that uh, the overall incidence and prevalence over time in the community is probably single digit percentages, yeah. five, six, seven percent. Yeah. And if you look at the total positive tests divided by the total community, you would see that. But yeah. on any daily, uh, on, a, on any given day on a daily basis, understanding the positivity rate, the percent positive out of those tests done, helps us understand the acute transmission of the disease. Yeah, and we would like to test as many people as possible and drive that number, that percent of positives, percent of the number of tests that we do that are positive down as much as possible to get in those single digits. You say, why do we do that? We'd love to do 10,000, 30,000 tests a day on our community. Mm -hmm. That also gives us so many more data points, and we really understand how prevalent it is in the community. So it unfortunately is only the tests that are being done, 
but we would like to be doing many more tests to really understand fully the prevalence in the community. What a uh, get a couple quick questions from the media. Go ahead. All right, Bob Hallinan, though, is with us this morning. Hi, Bob. Hello. Ashley is saying, good morning, everybody. For those out there indicating that gating criteria is skewed, can you discuss how the percentage of positive cases is applied to a community mm -hmm. and how this is not a new public health principle? So gating. I was asking about gating yesterday. Yeah. yeah. Wow. All right. <laughs> Who gets uh, us numbers, started? Man. <laughs> yeah. So here, here's what I would say about that. Um, I think that um, we have we have made um, a push to not have hard and fast gating criteria, um, meaning um, a 15% positivity rate cutoff, for example, um, as a hard and fast, this is yes and this is no, for whatever the question may be. I imagine that right now the question is around um, returning to school. Um, I think part of the reason that we've made that push is we know that there's really a, a sort of a continuum, that things are moving all of the time and decisions need to be made and plans uh, need to be made and interventions started when we see a trend change, not when we hit a specific number. So I think that's why we've been saying that the gating um, sort of mechanism or uh, that theory is, is absolutely important um, and it helps us have some bright lines, some clear yeses and nos. Um, but that we need to be acting here long before we hit a specific threshold. Um, so I think that, that, I hope that makes sense as far as an answer to the question. No doubt, gating mechanisms, um, uh, even the percent positive are important for us. Uh, but we would just advocate for interventions that start before we hit such a high level, like 15% positivity rate. So we get a lot of questions about saliva testing. Uh, the next question is, if saliva testing is not considered di diagnostic, how does it help with knowing the spread of infection? Dr. Mm -hmm. Hawkinson? Yeah, it's not considered diagnostic right now because the, the gold standard for diagnosis is the NP or the nasopharyngeal swab. As we move further into this and get more data about the vali uh, validity of the saliva test, the accuracy, meaning uh, of the sensitivity and specificity, meaning we want to make sure that if we tell you no, that your test for saliva testing is negative, that it truly is negative. And if we tell you yes, that it is positive. So right now, it is not diagnostic. There is an EUA for the saliva testing. Uh, but as we move further into this, hopefully that will be one of the more um, readily available diagnostic tests. But we just need to make sure their numbers are accurate so that when we give you a test result, you can be sure um, that it is an accurate test result. So another question was, if that happens, will we offer them here at the health system? Um, we, yeah, Dr. Leisman and Dr. Plapp in our lab are currently continuing to, to understand and validate all of these new tests and uh, what platform, what company they're going to use. They are working on that as well. So we are moving forward and we would like to do that as well. It saves on um, resources such as swabs, which are difficult to come by. Um, sometimes it saves on media, and some of the saliva testing also saves on certain steps to run the test as well. So absolutely, you know, our lab um, directors are working on that and looking at the, um, the most reliable and readily available tests out there. All right, next question. After someone tests positive, how long before they should be around others with chronic illness um, or considered to be at high risk? Mm -hmm. So how long should they wait? Yeah. Thoughts? Yeah, I think we know... Um, uh, from a, a handful of studies now, we know that it's probably no more than 10 or 11 days um, after the onset of symptoms or, or after a, t a positive test um, that most individuals shed virus and can infect others. And so um, it's probably safe at about that threshold. Yeah. Um, I think waiting two weeks is very reasonable. If you have uh, someone in your life who's uh, yes. at risk, has chronic disease, um, or is it high risk of complications uh, from COVID infection? Yeah, absolutely. You know, especially if you have mild or no symptoms mm -hmm. and you aren't having to go to the hospital, um, you know, certainly the CDC criteria, even KDHE would say after about 10 days. So if you, if you have that, you know, if you are a little bit anxious because there is a lot of anxiety around COVID as well, then probably pushing that out to that two weeks is reasonable. You can also use the masking. We have always advocated for masking in the household. 
Uh, you know, if you need, if they don't live in the household, if you want to go see them, meet outdoors. That's always safer, and stay the, the distance of six feet or more apart. And all those things will help to reduce um, disease spread, but also your anxiety. But probably after about ten days is what the CDC and the KDHE guidelines would say is when you can get back into society. Bob. This sort of comes along with that. Uh, Shelly wants to know, what are your thoughts on youth outdoor soccer? Uh, very high-risk parents, but the kiddo has been pretty strictly isolated for six months, and the kiddo will be learning from home this year. Interesting situation. Hmm. What are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this goes back to the overall question about youth sports. Um, and it's not just youth sports. It's other things that are, you know, extracurricular or in um in groups with other children, whether that's banned, you know, we've seen other things that the the Kansas um, or Wyandotte County talked about, you know, chess, anything where you're having other students uh, get together and other youth. This question was specifically towards soccer. I think you have to um, determine what is the risk mitigation on the soccer uh, practice field. What are the coaches doing? Are they wearing masks? Are they going to be spread apart from each other when they are not, you know, really doing the drills or anything like that. All those types of things are extremely important. We know the importance of, of getting back to, to sports and getting, doing physical activity for everybody, not just children, but adults too. We've talked about walking and running and being outside. So, you know, I think um, as we move forward, we will kind of really understand more what is the risk um, during the play, you know, certainly in game play, you're not having a lot of interaction with another opponent in soccer. There are times, you know, with free kicks, corner kicks, that you may be um, close to other or in proximity to a lot of other people on the field. You know, there's always a question, is there a lot of spitting or talking or yelling going on? Can we spread it that way? Certainly outdoors is better. Um, it's just a matter of how comfortable you feel with those types of situations in practice and in the game. Certainly if they're sitting on the bench, if you can get the kids spread out further, wearing masks, doing all those little things to overall try and mitigate the risk as much as possible. Are you using your soccer lingo today? Yeah, corner, corner kick. kicks. Yeah. Goal kick. It's, it's not really soccer, soccer lingo. It's, it's not, okay. I, I do want to, though, add maybe a little bit more to yeah. that. So I think um, it, it's a good opportunity to reinforce um, we have more and more evidence every day about what transmission in children mm -hmm. looks like. Um, again, uh, just in the last day or so, another study that shows very clearly that the viral load yeah. in children is equal to or higher than the viral load in adults, yep. and that kids transmit at exactly the same rate as adults do. Yeah. And so when we say, well, wow, we haven't seen a lot of kids sick, I would say there are two primary drivers for that. One we have not tested a lot of children. Mm -hmm. um, so as children are more likely to be asymptomatic and most of the testing in the United States so far has still been reserved for people who are symptomatic, we've not yeah. tested a lot of children. And two, our children have been home and isolated for months. Yep. In fact, probably at higher levels than most adults as adults have returned to work and returned to the community. And so um, that, I think, has to factor into this decision. There's a risk mitigation yeah. around the sport itself. How risky is the sport? What can you do to reduce transmission? Um, but I think we're now understanding that it's very unlikely that we will see limited spread in children. Yeah, and I, I would agree. You know, there was a good study in one of the uh, JAMA publications about really stopping school at that point. Early in the pandemic did save <coughs> disease yes. spread and lives. And, you know, the study that you're referring to from, you know, like you said, people weren't testing. As we are getting to our experience here in the United States, we are testing more. That study from Mass, Massachusetts General Hospital did actually show, too, that some of the children were having viral loads as higher or higher than adults who were going into the um, critical illness stage in the ICU as well. So we are still learning more and more about this, and that was a very good point that you brought up. I bet you both get a lot of questions from <laughs> you guys. I know you get texted all the time from friends and parents, and they want to know. Yeah. So all right, if we have time at the end, I'd like to get a little bit of a, a little back-to-school advice for parents. But, Bob, um, you have another question. Speaking of kids, uh, this kind of ties into how you were saying. It says, our, uh, Melissa says, our elementary school children return to school next week. I've read those ages commonly present with different beginning COVID symptoms than adults do, the shortness of breath, dry cough, et cetera. Is that correct? Or, what do you look for in kids? I think what we've seen is there's just a lot of variation in adults. That's, uh, that study that you had mentioned earlier, they looked 
only 50% of those children had fever. Um, so it's not always fever. And I think um, you know 20% of them had runny nose. So it, it is different than we are used to. I don't think we can make any blanket statement about this, but other than even in adults, we know it presents differently. There was a significant, um, uh, you know, 20% did have loss of smell as well, which was significant compared to other people who were being evaluated and were not COVID positive. But yeah, certainly for children, um, we understand that they may not have the fever just like um, you had asked about. Um, we are still learning about pediatrics in general. Luckily, they still seem to have less of a propensity to have to go to the hospital and, and go on the ventilator. But they can present either with very mild symptoms like that, um, or they can have no symptoms at all, but still continue to have that very high viral load. And still spread the same as adults. Yes, and I think, you know, a, around the symptom part of that question, I don't know if you've had these calls or not, Dana, but I had um, five or six calls last weekend mm -hmm. uh, of people saying, both my daughter and I have allergy symptoms yeah. right now, and we always have allergies, and I'm sure this is allergies, mm -hmm. but should I get tested? Um, and I think all of those ended up getting tested, and I think about half of them were positive. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's very possible that the symptoms, the more mild symptoms of runny yeah, nose, absolutely. a little bit of a cough, um, not necessarily shortness of breath, you know, prolonged dry cough or high fever, um, should be signs to indicate testing is warranted in, in that pediatric population, probably the same way as in adults. So we had a question about expanding our social bubble. So kids mm -hmm. and parents are going to be doing that as we head back to school and sports. So what is the best way to expand my bubble safely? Dana, do you want to start first? Well, you know, if um, school does happen, your bubble is going to be expanded. <laughs> I think you as the adults um, who is ever in the household need to continue to maintain um, a fairly strict bubble as much as possible, especially if you um, have family members or good friends that are of the vulnerable population uh, because your bubble will be expanded because your children are going to school if school is uh, deemed safe to have in-person <coughs> classes. Um, otherwise, if, you know, but certainly going out and being in large groups and going to parties, that is not a safe way to expand the bubble. So I think you need to take the same precautions as you took early in the pandemic when we did have the stay-at-home orders. Really um, understand who is it that you're going to see? You know, what is that situation that you're going to be seeing the other people? Groups of 10 or less are much better, or even smaller groups are better than uh, parties or get-togethers. Outdoors, separated, and uh, masking is vitally important as well. But if the children do go to school, or if they are in those sports or in those extracurricular activities, your bubble will be expanded because of that. So that is um, going to be important to understand and continue to maintain um, a monitoring for symptoms for other people that you know may have the disease. And then um, if that is true, you know, figure out, was I in contact with that person? Were my kids in contact with that person? Um, so I think just expanding your bubble slowly is probably going to be the best thing to do. Dr. Wild, what do you tell people? What advice do you have? I think the same things. Um, you know, uh, maybe even in, in my situation, our youngest is uh, three and a half, mm -hmm. and um, he's back in preschool full time. Uh, and his uh, daycare preschool program has done an excellent job of creating a very small six or seven children in a classroom, no interaction with other classrooms, the same two teachers all of the time, a very small bubble for him. But by definition, that is now our bubble. Mm -hmm. as, as Dana, as you were saying, you, you, your, your bubble expands to be the bubble of your children if your children live with you. And so, you know, the questions about socialization and how do we manage um, interaction between kids if they, if they aren't doing these things. We, we recognize that because our bubble already included those other yeah. kids, those five other kids or six other kids and their parents, those are our play dates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They're already in our bubble. So rather than expanding it to friends that we would like to see who have children the same age but aren't in the same class, we've just said, all right, we didn't have any choice. Our bubble had to expand mm -hmm. because we needed the option of, of daycare and preschool. Um, and so that, that was our choice. That's how we expanded. And I think you just have to approach it like that and realize that everyone who lives in your house, their bubble is your bubble. And um, it'll be expanding at the same rate that each of those people's bubbles. And I like that tip. Keep your play dates to your classmates. <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good one. Bob, we have some questions from the media. We do. Cody from Channel 9 is keeping on this uh, 
kids in schools theme says I've seen a number of schools move to hybrid learning plans where a student will spend a day in class mm -hmm. then a day at home what are your concerns about this when it comes to health and curbing the spread of COVID yeah. who wants to start <laughs> <laughs> well you know all of these strategies are risk mitigation we know that the virus is out there we know it's spreading you may know people who have been positive or recently positive we see stories every day about college campuses opening and more positives. Um, so I think, you know, moving forward, you know, this hybrid model, depending on what it is, is all about reducing the risk as much as possible. It's about reducing the number of people meeting. Um, it's about spacing them out when they are there. Um, certainly we, we know and masking should be mandatory in these schools, especially in the, you know, say, um, second, first grade and above, you know, kindergarten is probably a little bit more difficult for the younger, but even the younger kids can do it. So masking, but it's really an attempt to reduce the amount of people that are in contact with other people and have that uh, physical spread out. You know, we have to understand that um, even on the CDC guidance for school openings, it says you may consider masks even if people are six feet apart. And I think people are really trying to get around that or look at the letter of the law rather than the spirit of the law. Mm -hmm. And in fact, what we should be doing is masking everywhere indoors. In fact, what De Dr. Burks told us is that, and even Dr. Fauci has said this, you know, when I'm outside and around other people, I'm still wearing masks. Or, uh, you know, Dr. Burks' message to us was, our messaging about masking has become um, somewhat confusing. So really, the message is wear a mask. So even if you're inside, if you're spread out about six feet or more, you probably need to have the mask on. And this hybrid model is just one more reason and one more way to try and reduce the risk of spread of the disease to the students, to their households, and to the teachers, administrators, um, you know, custodial people, everybody else in that school as well. My kid just, my seven-year-old just went to the hybrid model. And just on your message of masking, yeah. uh, I think a lot of times parents don't want to wear masks, but my kids wear masks. I have a four-year-old and yeah. a seven-year-old, and they'll wear it in the car, and I'll go, oh, babe, you don't need to, you can take it off. No, it's all right. I got it. Or yeah, the other day, we great. ran up to a, um, a playground, and my daughter goes, oh, it looks like a lot of people here. I think I'll wear my mask. And, she, and then my little four-year-old said, well, I don't want to get sick, so I'm going to wear my mask, too. <laughs> and I think it's, sometimes it's just the parents. And yeah. don't, would you agree that, you know, kids are pretty resilient yeah. and adaptable? Mm -hmm. uh, what would your message be about that? Yeah, oh, I think that's right. I think, um, you know, the more we have the conversation with our children, this is to, right, to, to protect you and our entire community and to make sure that we can do these things, like go to school and go to the park and play, uh, play soccer, uh, the better off we are. And, and I do think that um, in many times our, our children are, are um, easier to yeah, manage absolutely. a change in behavior than, than maybe we are for, for whatever reason. Sure. They will definitely take cues from us. But I we also have to remember, we, we, we continue to say this, the mask is not really for protection of you. The mask is a barrier protection for other people so that if you are one of those asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic people, and even in children we just talked about, they have very high viral loads. They can express it into the environment. Maybe not with the force that an adult can, but they still have very high viral loads. So the mask acts as a barrier. So if we can get everybody wearing that, especially in the indoors um, areas, that's going to be best. Now the mask will offer a little bit of protection for you as well. But if both parties are wearing a mask, that's going to be the optimal practice. Okay, so as we head back to school, the flu yeah. is an issue, as it is always this time of year. So uh, the next question is, is it safe to get a flu shot through a drive through clinic during a pandemic? Or is it just get one no matter yeah. what the cost? What are your thoughts? You know, I think that it's probably a very safe um, um, prospect to do it through a drive through clinic if there are drive through clinics available. Your interaction with somebody is going to be very brief. Most likely that person is going to have on a face mask and probably eye protection, either a, a, a face shield or goggles. And you should be wearing a face mask as well. So I think it's probably a fairly safe process. Dr. Wild, so you were talking about like the confusion between allergy symptoms and COVID mm -hmm. symptoms. And so now you add flu to the mix. What, what problems does that pose as far as tracking these cases? Yeah, I think, you know, we, we very much anticipate that issue as we enter flu season this year. That, right, influenza-like illness, of which COVID-19 is one, yes. um, you know, is, is always an issue in the fall. Um, as, as flu season really picks up. And, and we know it's likely 
that we're going to have both present mm -hmm. in the community at the mm -hmm. same time, um, influenza and, mm -hmm. and obviously COVID-19. And then all of the other yep. respiratory viral illnesses that, that normally come um, with fall, you know, people spending more time indoors, schools yeah. being in session. Uh, and it means that we're going to have a more complicated testing process this year than we normally do for influenza. And, and um, it's likely that the combination of those two influenza season on top of COVID is going to put some additional level of strain on our healthcare system. Um, and while at the moment we're still comfortable that we're not approaching a place where our healthcare system is overwhelmed, um, I think we do have to be honest that it's definitely stressed and likely to become more stressed in flu season. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we are constantly full with people who need health care, not because we're full of COVID patients, right. but any increase in the number of people needing hospitalization is, is going to put more stress on the system. And so both testing and capacity, um, I'm, I'm a little bit concerned about as we enter flu season, no doubt. So is the flu uh, vaccine or the flu shot, is it available now and should we get it early for any reason? I don't believe it's available now. We will start doing our screening here at the health system on September 21st, I believe. So they are uh, shipping them out. We don't have it at this point. Um, some other commercial entities may. Um, but yeah, I mean, we want to make sure that you do get it. And we always have said, and in, uh, in line with the CDC, we never want to miss an opportunity to vaccinate. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, mm -hmm. having access, and everybody can have access now because it is available at clinics, at pharmacies. Um, it'll be available here at the health system. You know, if you know you can get some time later, certainly maybe uh, mid to late October to early November is going to be probably the latest time you want to get it. That will offer immunity through probably the end of the typical flu season. Um, but if you don't think you'll have another opportunity, then get it when you can. Uh, we know that um, at the end of last year, at the flu season, um, during the initial parts of the pandemic, we didn't see a lot of, of co-infections with influenza. And, um, and COVID, we know that the Australian experience right now, because they are in their flu season, is going very well and they are having very reduced rates of influenza. But that's probably because of the masking, the distancing, all of that. So we hope for that too. Um, we certainly don't want to have a co-infection with COVID-19 and influenza because getting influenza will also set you up for a secondary bacterial pneumonia. And that is where a lot of the deaths and the morbidity and the mortality come from with influenza as it did in 1918. So you just don't wanna be battling another infection as well. So yes, get your influenza vaccine. Don't miss an opportunity to vaccinate. If you otherwise have very good access to it, you may wanna wait till October just so you have that longer lasting immunity for the rest of the flu season. All right, good to know. Another question we get a lot is, if I had COVID-19 once, <laughs> am I immune to it? And I, I always think there's an issue because I hear a lot of people say, well, I think I had it back then. You don't mm -hmm. know. So then people have this like false sense of security that maybe they think they've had it and that they're safe from it mm -hmm. and that they can't spread it. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, obviously a question we all get frequently. Um, I think that the, the, the best answer we have is um, we still really don't know. Yeah. I think it's likely that most people who have had the disease have some degree of immunity. Uh, whether that means it prevents, you have enough immunity to prevent you from uh, getting the disease again and how long that immunity would last um, is, is still very much unknown. But um, the thought of having at least some degree of partial immunity uh, would be if you do get it again, you don't have as severe symptoms. You're not likely, as likely to uh, end up in the hospital or the ICU. Uh, and the question in that case, of course, is, well, are you able to transmit it still? Yeah. Um, and, and unfortunately, we just don't have solid answers for those things. Yeah. So my, my response on, well, how should I behave based on that is act like you can get it again. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we... Um, we don't have a lot of uh, data, like you said, a lot of publications. There is some, a couple um, rhesus macaque publications. So rhesus macaques are the monkey model or the animal model that we use um, in COVID-19. Um, when they have re-challenged um, the rhesus macaques after, say, four, six, eight weeks after initial infection, they found that they did not get symptoms and they had a reduced viral load. So that is good information. We would hope that if you have had it, 
you um, don't get symptoms again or you have more mild symptoms and you don't have a high viral load so you can't spread it to other people. There's a recent preprint publication, so it hasn't been validated or peer reviewed yet, uh, but looking at a case study from a large fishing vessel out in Seattle that went out, um, there were 122 people on board. Several of those people prior to getting on board did have um, COVID in the past and had immunity or had antibodies detectable. There was the, um, the disease was actually spread through the ship uh, they, and they understood that those people did not get symptoms or did not get ill from it. So it looked like there was some immunity. Again, it's a very small study. There are some caveats to that study as well. But overall, we hope that you do have immunity. So if you do get it again, at least in the say three, six, nine month period, you won't have symptoms or you'll have less symptoms. But the important thing is, can you still spread it and maybe have less viral load? We don't know that. So even if you've had it, um, you still need to take those precautions of masking, not meeting in large groups and physical distancing. Bob? You just mentioned it, and I think several people have asked this, Debbie in particular, please explain what a viral load means. Mm -hmm. Okay, so very good, Zay. We've probably been using that. So viral load um, is just the amount of virus in a certain volume. And for the most part, the viral loads that we're talking about are, for instance, uh, a million viral particles per milliliter of um, sputum or respiratory fluid that they take. Um, and uh, what they found, or the best evidence that we have, is that if they are able to sample your um, NP or your respiratory tract and able to get a million uh, copies of the virus or a million particles of the virus per milliliter, it's just something that's done in the lab. If you have that or more, you are probably more likely to transmit the disease than if you have less than a million copies um, in your upper respiratory tract. So that's what viral load is. Now there's other things we measure viral load for, such as HIV, when we have patients um, who have not started medication yet or, or who are on medication. And for the most part, that is a viral load that we take from the blood. Same thing with, he with hepatitis C. And that basically, again, it just means the amount of virus in a certain volume um, of your body fluid. Next question is, uh, the FDA pressed pause on an emergency approval of blood plasma to treat COVID-19. What does that mean? Uh, are trials being done? Is the yeah, health system uh, still using it for patients? Mm -hmm. Dr. Wild? Sure, I, I'll, I'll start. I think Dana probably mm -hmm. can talk more about how we're still using it in, uh, in our patients. So here's sort of the story maybe behind this pause. Uh, the FDA um, issues emergency use authorizations for treatments the same way that they do for tests. And so this EUA term that we've all uh, heard very frequently around testing is also true for, for any treatment. And um, it does sound like the FDA was getting ready. We anticipated actually this week an EUA release approval uh, for um, convalescent, convalescent serum or plasma. And uh, actually it sounds like the NIH said, are we sure we have enough data uh, to say that this is truly beneficial in all patient populations. Uh, we've seen this actually, uh, this issue in, in a few of the other trials, um, under representation of certain populations in the trial group. And I think that was part of the question here. So uh, they just asked the question, are we sure this is, uh, uh, we have enough data to say for sure we should use this, knowing that the second that we stop doing trials and offer an EUA, we stop getting the same level of data, yep. truly prospectively understanding the difference between a control group and population not receiving um, the plasma yep. in this case and, and those that do. So um, it, you know, that, that dynamic is interesting because the FDA truly is independent and can do what they want. They don't need to mm -hmm. maybe take um, the, the advice or, or answer the question of the NIH, but I think it's a fair one to ask because yeah. we will all benefit from this. Absolutely. And from the perspective of is this available, are we using it, I think the yeah. answer still remains yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think there, there, there was a study, I have to go back and look if I recall, that showed that severe patients, it, it really wasn't as effective. I believe it probably will be effective, but I think it also matters what time point in the infection do you give it? I think earlier to try and prevent some of that early symptoms um, or early um, path to the complications, it's gonna be more beneficial than later in the course. Um, we are still giving it here at the health system. Uh, it is run by Dr. Ella Truni, who's been very busy. Um, also, Dr. Y is helping as well. And that's in collaboration with the Mayo Clinic. We've given it to at least 70 different patients 
So we are giving it, but it is, as Dr. Wild stated, it's still on the trial basis so that we can obtain the relevant information and data to really find out if it's efficacious. It certainly looks safe, but just to make sure that there is efficacy in that. So last question today, uh, we were talking about the flu a little bit. Will wearing a mask have any effect on the severity of the upcoming flu season? We're all wearing masks to help protect from COVID. Is that gonna help with the spread of flu? I think we all believe the answer is yes. Dane already mentioned the Australian flu season, that it appears that um, that the, the, the flu season there is more mild or less severe uh, in spread and number yeah. than a normal year at this point. And so uh, it, it makes sense logically as well that um, respiratory viruses in general, the spread would be less if we were doing these things, wearing a mask, uh, physically distancing, limiting our contact with others. So I, I think the answer is yes, we anticipate that. It, it seems logical. Yeah. yeah, I think overall on the population level, whether it's the community or the state or the nation, I think and I believe and hopefully we will see a reduced amount of um, diagnoses of influenza, but also the complications of influenza. Um, on an individual level, it's hard to say because we've had several colleagues in the past month or two that have had coughs or colds because we do have typical summer viruses that, that go around and spread through the community um, who've been diagnosed with that as well, who didn't have COVID, but has symptoms of it. So we know that those viruses are still out there. So on a population level, yes, I believe it will have an impact and a, a positive impact. But on an in, in individual level, you are probably still going to be at risk to get these other circulating viruses. Um, so again, I think the masking overall will help, the hand hygiene will help, and the physical distancing is going to help as well. All right. I would, did you have something else to add? Oh, well? I was just going to throw out there, right, and do my best Stites impression, but right, the principles Please. of infection prevention, yeah. here they come again. They, they also w will be a benefit for all of those diseases. So. Good to know. Okay, so I want to get both of your final thoughts here in just a moment. Okay. Uh, just a couple of quick reminders before we head out on this Friday. Blood supplies remain low as we continue to report. Uh, you can help by donating next Thursday or Friday. You can make an appointment. That is preferred, but it's not necessary. You just might have to wait just a bit. But uh, you can go to donate.savealifenow.org org and sign up. Dr. Stites will be back on Monday. Um, we're going to have big news from the front lines on an innovation for doctors thought up to help protect healthcare workers from COVID. Mm -hmm. It is still uh, waiting FDA approval. Very exciting, Dr. Wild. I think this is uh, some of your folks um, mm -hmm. who did this, some fellow mm -hmm. anesthesiologists. Is that correct? That is true. All right. Okay. So we'll, we'll be looking forward to hearing more about that. But what are your final thoughts before we head out to the weekend? Um, I think it's the same message <laughs> that we, um, that we yeah. offer all of the time um, as we go into the weekend please be vigilant continue uh, to pay attention to the things that we know work wearing your mask limiting your exposure to others physically distancing keeping your bubble small mm -hmm. um, i think uh, that that we cannot uh, overstate the importance of those things as we try really hard to um, limit the spread of disease in our community keep everyone safe be respectful of each other and, and continue um, to be able to do the things that we enjoy and, and want to do Dr. Yeah. yeah, going back to one of our first questions, you know, we certainly want to continue to expand access for testing um, for the acute infection of COVID-19 to as, as much as possible, as many people as possible, uh, to have that access, to get one when you need it, when you want it, every day if possible. We don't have that capacity yet. Hopefully the saliva will help with that, the saliva testing. Uh, but once we can do that, we will hopefully be able to drive down that percent of positives, although maybe our total cases will increase because we are doing more tests. But that also gives us so many more data points to really understand how prevalent it is in the community. And when we know that, we will be able to isolate everybody who has it and hopefully um, overall drive down the spread of the disease and one more step towards getting back to the life that we would all like to get back to. Um, so otherwise, keep um, meeting in small groups, 10 or less, less than 10 is much better, less than five, six is better. Know your bubble, um, keep distance and keep wearing your masks. Thank you both. I was going to say thanks for hanging with me today, but thanks for yeah. me hanging with you guys. You did a good job. <laughs> I you sit among these job. smart guys. I love that. Okay, so we know a lot of folks are uh, going back to school. Parents, kids have a lot of questions, a lot of anxiety um, as school starts up soon. So uh, in today's episode of Sunny Says, she kind of demystifies a little bit of that. She takes a trip to school inside the classroom and on the bus just to get a little bit of a sneak peek of what school might look like um, when you all go back. So take a, take a look and have a wonderful weekend.
I'm Sunny and I'm going in the second grade. School's going to look a little bit weird this year. You might have questions. It might look different for everybody. But here's a sneak peek at what it might look like. Remember, Sunny says, have your mask ready. Make sure it's comfortable. You'll wear it most of the day. First things first. Good morning, Sunny. You might have your temperature taken at the door. You're good to go. Sunny says, it's okay. It's not scary. You'll probably walk to class alone. Remember to stop by the hand sanitizing station. Follow the signs and keep your distance. Your classroom might look like this. Desks will be spaced apart, and you won't get up as much. Instead of hooks or lockers, you might keep your things in a bin close to your desk. You might have more iPad time. It's nice to share, but Sunny says no sharing supplies this year. That can spread germs. Sunny says, most importantly, listen to your teacher. You might have to eat lunch at your desk, but at least you can take off your mask. Sunny says, remember, it won't be like this forever. At recess, you'll see your friends, but still keep your distance. Remember, it's smart to stay six feet apart. Sunny says, don't use the drinking fountains. Instead, keep your water bottles full. You'll be asked to wash your hands a lot and use hand sanitizer. If you take the bus, you'll get on and walk all the way to the back. Pick the first seat available. One kid to a seat, if possible. Sunny says, be cool at school, stay safe, and follow the rules.